If you have a few minutes to spare, I'd like to tell you a story. She was just 12 years old. She was on her way home from the library. She didn't make it. As her father put it, she was taken by the sin in a human heart. If only these trees could talk. I want to tell you the story of little Marion Brubaker, a young girl who went into the woods on a summer day in August of 62 and never came out. Marion, 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 what kind of evil strangles a 12-year-old child to death? And how the hell did he get away with it? We are here in Portage Lakes, a suburb to the south of Akron, Ohio, to take a look at Marion Brubaker's hometown. On August 27, 1962, Marion was attacked and strangled in these woods on the corner of Main Street and Killian Road. As we take a look at where Marion lived, along with the residents of at least one person of interest in the case, we will also follow the path that authorities believe Marion took on that warm summer day in August of 62. With grief etched in his face, Marion's father, Reverend Claire Brubaker, quietly spoke to reporters. She had permission to take the shortcut home through the woods. There was no disobedience on her part. All the children used the shortcut, which we believed was safe. She was about on time and almost out of the woods. That was true. The path through the woods was known by locals and often used by those in the neighborhood. Marion herself had used it on several occasions without incident. And now these woods will forever be the marker for her murder. Reverend Brubaker would go on to say that Marion was a fine Christian girl. She was bright and studious, and she had dreams of becoming a piano teacher. But those dreams would never be made a reality, as her life was cruelly taken by a sick and perverted individual. Before I tell you Marion's heartbreaking fate, Let's go through the original timeline that authorities were able to establish after her body was found. Marion left home between 2 and 2.15 p.m. on her bicycle. She was on her way to Portage Lakes Public Library on Manchester Road. Authorities believe Marion may have taken a longer route that day, using winding roads to get there. She arrived at the library at around 3 p.m. and borrowed four books. Two librarians reported checking out Marion's books and then watched as she pedaled off on her bicycle alone. Marion ran an errand for her mother, stopping at Scott's, a store in Coventry Plaza, to buy a greeting card. From the store to her return home, we will now show you the path that police believe Marion took. Her route home takes approximately 8 minutes by car and about 20 minutes by bicycle. The area is full of winding roads which snake along the shores of Portage Lakes and consists mostly of residential neighborhoods.
It's here in the vicinity of 738 Portage Lakes Drive that she was last seen alive at around 3.12 p.m. by a family driving through. Although it's tough to gauge how much traffic this area would have seen in 1962, it's hard to imagine that Marion was only spotted once. It is then my opinion that her journey home could have attracted the attention of an opportunistic predator. Marion traveled east to Main Street, then south about a block to the beginning of the wooded path which led to her home. Marion entered the woods shortly after 3.30 p.m., and her life would end just minutes later. Marion was found at half past four by a neighborhood team. The boy said he was just roaming the woods when he came upon her. Her bicycle lay under an apple tree, about 40 feet from the path and about 30 feet from her body. This is a map of the scene that was published in the local newspaper. The books that she had just checked out at the library were spilled out onto the grass near the bicycle. The greeting card that she had picked up for her mother lay among the books. Her small black purse looked as if it had just been tossed aside. The details given by investigators of what happened to Marion Brubaker are horrific and made even more heartbreaking by the coroner's report. Investigators were unable to determine if Marion was on her bike or walking beside it when she was struck down. The spot where the attack took place was in a clearing about 887 feet from the wood's entrance. A small amount of blood-soaked dirt and bits of hair were found in the matted grass. Pieces of Marion shattered glasses and shards from a broken bottle, which authorities speculated may have been used as a weapon, were found in the same spot. A button from Marion's blouse was found in some foliage close to her body. Authorities stated that Marion was most likely rendered incapacitated and then dragged a few dozen yards east of the path to where her body was found in some bushes. Crooked drag marks could be seen from the point of the attack to where she lay. Her killer would have worked quickly to silence her and get her off the path before they were seen. Coroner J. Harlan Dix stated that the front of Marion's body was badly scratched, suggesting that she was dragged face down by one hand and one foot through the thicket. The coroner went on to say that a large quantity of dirt was found in Marion's mouth, nose, and windpipe. This supported his theory that she was alive when she swallowed or inhaled the dirt from one of two ways, being dragged or having her face pushed into the earth during the struggle. Two of Marion's upper front teeth were loosened, giving testament to just how brutal the attack was. There was no question that she died by strangulation exerted by someone with great strength. Blood vessels were broken as far up as her ears. There was a cut on the back of her head measuring two inches wide and a half inch deep, which did not appear to come from a blow. Marion weighed 123 pounds and was a healthy, wiry young lady. It would have been difficult to subdue her lending even more support to the fact that her killer had exerted 
a great amount of strength during the murder. At the beginning of the case, there were conflicting reports on whether Marion had been sexually assaulted. Eventually, the coroner's office released a statement confirming that she had been. In more recent years, it was revealed that Marion was not sexually assaulted, and the most likely possibility is that the killer had become startled and was unable to finish the act. When pressed about the motive for Marion's murder, detectives and the coroner agreed on the following details. The brutality of the attack was consistent with a sexual assault. It was a violent, passionate crime in every sense of the word. The killer was berserk and animal-like. Marion's clothes had been torn off, leaving her nearly nude. Robbery was ruled out because no items belonging to Marion had been taken. What struck authorities the most was the undeniable fact that the killer had staged the crime scene in several ways. When police arrived at the scene at 4.30 p.m., Marion lay face up and her body was still warm to the touch. Her shoes and socks were placed near her head. As one detective put it, they were placed as neatly as one would put them by the bed at night. Another oddity in Marion's clothing led authorities to a guilt theory. Her blouse and brassiere were torn in the front and pulled upward beneath her shoulders. And then the killer placed her red check shorts and panties that had been turned inside out on Marion's face. When deputies removed the clothing, they found Marion's eyes still open and lifelike. Sheriff Robert Campbell said, I don't think the killer could stand to look at those eyes accusing him. I think his own guilt made him cover her face. He must still see those eyes in his sleep. The bicycle that lay beneath an apple tree and the books scattered about had all been cleaned of prints, except for two partials that still remain unidentified. The only thing that seemed out of place was a girly magazine found on another path in the woods, leading authorities to believe it was somehow connected to the case. Investigators quickly put together a profile of the killer. The killer was someone who acted on sudden impulses. His motive was sexual. He was strong, berserk. He had enough presence of mind to destroy some evidence. He feels a strong sense of guilt. The killer was not a stalker. It was purely an impulse ambush. He was familiar with the neighborhood and frequented the woods. With this profile in mind, investigators turned their attention to two persons of interest, Ralph Bechter and William Lewis. Ralph was the 15-year-old who found Marion's body shortly after her murder. William was a peddler found roaming outside the woods soon after the murder. Bechter and Lewis would both play major roles in Marion's case. One of them would stay the focus of the investigation through the decades. Let's first turn our attention to Ralph Bechter, a 15-year-old boy who lived here at 3208 South Main Street, across from the woods. The 5 feet, 10 inch, 200 pound teen had been in some trouble before. He was accused of molesting a 13-year-old girl on two separate occasions. During both occurrences, Ralph had to be pulled off the girl. It was also reported that he used vulgar language with a girl and sent her obscene notes. Ralph admitted to grabbing the girl, but said he never sexually assaulted her. An attorney for the boy said the girl continued to visit the Bechter home as recently as two weeks before Marion was murdered and held no resentment at what happened. Authorities were quickly becoming suspicious as they questioned Ralph for 10 hours without counsel present. At first, he lied to deputies when he told them that he didn't know Marion, then said he knew her from school. Other reports claimed that Ralph had been seen on Marion's porch numerous times with a friend. Then deputies pressed the boy about his appearance. Ralph's shirt was torn, the zipper on his pants was down, and he had scratches on his hands and arms. Bechter told deputies that he got the scratches while roaming around the woods that day. 
It was later reported that the zipper on Ralph's pants had been broken before Marion's murder. During the 10 hours of intense questioning, Ralph never wavered about his movements through the woods that day and emphatically denied his involvement in Marion's murder. This is what Ralph said happened when he entered the woods on August 27, 1962. Ralph stated he entered the woods at around 3.30 p.m. This would have been around the same time Marion started down the path. After roaming the woods for a short period of time, the teen said he came across Marion's bicycle and books. The boy admitted to handling the items. He claimed that he did not see Marion's body at that time. He then continued on the path until he came to the open field just beyond the woods. Once at the clearing, Ralph remembered seeing a man riding a tractor and then decided to retrace his path through the woods. This is when he discovered Marion's body. Ralph stated that he ran back to get help from the man on the tractor, but the man had already left. Now panicking, Ralph said that he ran back into the woods, passed Marion's body, and stopped only long enough to wipe down the items that he had touched. He then continued to run home to get help. Ralph's father told authorities that his son came running into the house and yelled, I think there's a dead girl in the woods. Ralph reached home at 4.25 p.m., and the call to the sheriff's office came in at 4.30 p.m. The 15-year-old was given a polygraph test that came back inconclusive and was then taken to a juvenile detention home pending further questioning. Bechter's attorney stated this at the time. Ralph has been questioned extensively by a battery of experienced officers who have yet to establish any basis for charges other than delinquency for the prior offense. Everyone has taken a pot shot at him. Ralph was eventually released, and juvenile judge Russell Thomas ordered treatment for the teen, saying, We want to change some of your habits, some of your thinking, some of your desires. Now that there were no forthcoming charges against Ralph, authorities would turn their attention to William Lewis. Lewis suffered from what authorities called mental abnormalities. The peddler, who couldn't read and could only barely write his name, was found wandering around the edge of the woods at 5 p.m. the day Marion was murdered. Detectives questioned Lewis, but did not take any of his story at face value and soon released him. Once released, Lewis went to a Greyhound bus station where he was known to hang out. He told Ted Bell, a ticket agent, the story of seeing a dead girl in the woods. The agent didn't take his comments seriously until Marion's murder was reported in a local newspaper. Bell told Thomas Anderson, a former deputy and friend of his, about Lewis's statement. Anderson sat on that information until February of 1964 when he decided to run against Sheriff Campbell. Anderson tried putting Campbell in the hot seat by claiming that he passed the tip along to the sheriff's office, but they failed to act on it. Campbell denied the allegations and immediately ordered Lewis in for questioning. The first stop in the hunt for the 49-year-old Lewis was at his sister's house at Cottage Grove in Portage Lakes. Lewis had an 85-year-old wife in Akron, but the two were living apart and he was often seen visiting his sister. When authorities questioned Lewis's sister, she began to cry and stated, I have been afraid of it all along. When Lewis was finally tracked down in Canton, Ohio, authorities said that Lewis blurted out, Do you want to see me about the woods? Upon further inquiry into Lewis's background, the following details emerged. In 1946, Lewis was charged with receiving money under false pretenses. He served 30 days in jail. In 1947, Lewis was a patient at Hawthornden, a psychiatric state hospital. From 1950 to 52, Lewis was involved in minor police incidents. 
1960, he was arrested for intoxication. When questioned, Lewis admitted to seeing the girl's body in the woods that day, but denied killing her. When given a polygraph test, authorities stated that Lewis had no response whatsoever to normal questions. He was then taken to the scene and asked to point out what he saw the day of Marion's murder. Lewis showed them almost exactly where Marion had been found. He laid down on his back to show the position of Marion's body. He also showed them where her bike was hidden under a tree. Authorities pointed out that Lewis couldn't have known certain details if he hadn't actually been at the scene. Following hours of interrogation, Lewis would finally admit to killing Marion. Upon reflection in his cell, Lewis said he talked to God. I got down on my knees. I said, God, what do you want me to do? And he told me to tell the truth. That's what I did. I feel good now. I got it off my chest. This is what Lewis admitted to doing to Marion on that horrible day in August. Like Marion, Lewis stated that he was using the path as a shortcut. Lewis contends he knew Marion and that they talked for about 10 minutes on the wooded path. I wanted to see everything her had on her, he explained. He said he knocked Marion unconscious with his fist. He told of crushing the girl's glasses with his feet so her couldn't see me anymore. Lewis then stripped off most of Marion's clothes. When Marion began to revive and scream, he dragged her face down by the hands off the main path and choked her to death. Lewis stated that he got the girl's bicycle clothes and purse and brought them to the area where her body was laying. Lewis said, I heard the sheriff coming. He was referring to the sirens of officers responding to an accident not far from the woods that day. Lewis said he ran from the woods and out onto Killian Road. To reinforce Lewis's statements of events, deputies confirmed that a woman reported seeing a man running across the plowed field at the edge of the woods at about 4.15 p.m. when she was driving west on Killian Road. The identity of that man still remains unknown. Lewis was charged with first-degree murder, and he later recanted his confession stating that he was confused at the time. A grand jury refused to indict Lewis because they claim the details he gave of the murder were those printed in the local newspapers. They also took into account his history of mental illness. Reports from therapists stated that Lewis was feeble-minded but not violent. Lewis was declared insane and committed to a state hospital. Marion's father talked to Lewis for an hour but declined to reveal the nature of his conversation with the man who confessed to strangling his child. Reverend Brubaker did say, he insists that he did it. However, I'm not sure. There still are things, in my opinion, that need looking into. When reports of Lewis's confession were made public, Ralph Bechter temporarily breathed a sigh of relief. Bechter, who was put on probation for the molestation of the 13-year-old girl, had this to say about his ordeal. It was terrible, like a long nightmare. You don't realize how it feels to be telling the truth, know you're telling the truth, and know that some people don't believe you. All I did was what I was supposed to do. I'm glad it's over. But it was never really over for Ralph Bechter not even when Akron Police Sergeant Jack Carlton, who believed Bechter was innocent, gave this statement one year after Marion's murder. None of the physical evidence connected Ralph to it. Carlton would go on to detail how his clothing and shoes showed no blood and there were two prints on one of Marion's books that were not Bechter's. Those prints have not been identified. Carlton believed that a thorough house-to-house -house canvas of the neighborhood should have been made immediately after Marion's body was found. It possibly would have turned up something. We talked to many people, but a house-to-house -house canvas was never made. 
The guy who committed this crime will do it again eventually because it was an impulsive, vicious crime. Although Bechter was never linked in any way to Marion's murder, he would always remain on law enforcement's radar. In 2012, there was an update on Marion's case. Sheriff's Detective Larry Brown discovered that there was no record of Marion's fingernails being scraped and tested. There was a slim possibility that her nails could contain a DNA sample. Brown knew that Ohio rarely exhumes bodies in criminal cases, but Marion was an exception. In 2014, Brown swore out an affidavit in court, and a judge allowed the exhumation of Marion's body here at Hillside Memorial Park. The remains were taken to the Summit County Medical Examiner's Office so that DNA samples from fingernail clippings could be extracted. Detective Brown spoke with a then 67-year-old Bechter in 2014 about Marion. Brown said that Bechter listened as he let him know that Marion had been exhumed and they were checking the fibers from the murder. Brown said Ralph was calm and once again denied any wrongdoing and declined to take another polygraph test. During Brown's investigation of Marion's murder, he was able to obtain recent information about Bechter's life. Ralph had married a woman with children and was accused of sexually abusing her daughters during divorce proceedings. They handled everything in-house, and nobody reported anything to Children's Services. Ralph was also known to talk about Marion when he was drunk, making others feel uncomfortable. When the results came back on Marion's fingernail clippings, the news was devastating. No DNA was found. Of course, William Lewis was never above suspicion either. There were two other children that were murdered not far from where Marion was attacked and strangled. The area of these two murders was well known by Lewis, who was often seen peddling his wares in those neighborhoods. Investigators considered a possible link in the murders of Tommy Summerix and Ruth Guthrie to Marion Brubaker. Just ten months after Marion was killed, Summerix and Guthrie would become the next victims. On June 5, 1963, 15-year-old Tommy went missing after walking to a neighborhood shopping center to purchase a pair of shoes. On May 2, 1964, Tommy's remains were found 10 miles from his home under an 80-foot-high tulip tree. He had been gagged and his hands had been tied. Tommy's pelvic bones were broken in two places and an 18-inch piece of rope was found near his neck. Ruth went missing seven days after Tommy on June 12, 1963. The 12-year-old disappeared on her way home from a local fair. Ruth's remains were found 22 miles away from her home, laying face up under a large hickory tree in the woods on May 27, 1964. Her arms were crossed in front of her with her hands tied. She was nude from the waist down. Her clothes were found near her remains, and her white sneakers were still on her feet. The coroner surmised that Ruth had been strangled. Lewis had peddled his wares through most of the suburbs where Marion, Ruth, and Tommy were murdered. Investigators knew that Lewis had more knowledge of backways and byways of the area than most others. Mrs. Guthrie remembered that Lewis had been at her house selling potholders but couldn't remember if it was before or after Ruth went missing. The problem that investigators had with Lewis being the culprit in all three murders was the fact that Lewis didn't own a car and he couldn't drive. So if Lewis was somehow involved in the murders of Tommy and Ruth, how did their bodies turn up 10 to 20 miles away from where they were last seen alive? At the time of these unsolved murders, Portage County Assistant Prosecutor Chester Ellenlow summed up what law enforcement felt about the murders of these children. It may be several years, if ever, before they are solved. Sometime, someplace, someone may want to come clean and get it off his conscience.
and so we wait. All we can do is pray for that one break in Marion's case. Driving through Marion's hometown, retracing the path that she took the day she was murdered, and visiting her grave has been a truly emotional experience. I can only imagine the pain that her family felt when they laid her to rest here. One must ask themselves, can victims of murder ever truly rest when their killer walks free? If you have any information about the murder of Marion Brubaker, please contact the Summit County Sheriff's Office at 330-643-2181. Thank you for tuning in today. If you like our videos and would like to help our channel grow, please consider sharing this video with a friend. Also, if you aren't already subscribed to EOJ, please consider doing so. It's completely free and it's the best way to stay in the loop about our channel and get notified when videos will be uploaded. As always, stay well and be safe. Until we see you again with another cold case, this has been Eye on Justice.